Hi there, this is chapter six. This is Dr. Moyer. We'll be talking about adult sexuality tonight. We'll start with developmental tasks, according to Erickson. We'll look at dating issues for adults. We'll talk about sexuality and lifestyles, gay and lesbian partnerships, infidelity, and we'll finish with divorce. So according to Eric Erickson's theory of psychosocial development, the major task that needs to be completed in young adulthood is intimacy or forming committed intimate and loving relationships. Um, during college, this can be a common occurrence. Many friendships often lead to close, intimate relationships. And it can be difficult for parents to determine when it is appropriate to start dating. And then how do they go about it when they do have children? So it's important to still satisfy the need for companionship, but it's it, you have to make it clear to children that the purpose isn't to replace or diminish a parent's desire. I'm sorry, to re <laughs> not to replace or diminish the other parent's role. And so the parent that's not present in the relationship. So a single mother starts dating. It's important for her to reassure her, her child or children that dating partners are not meant to replace their father, their biological father, if they have one. Um, Pickhart, in 1996, posted some suggestions in his research. Don't include children on early dates because children can assume, especially if they're younger, that a relationship is more serious than it is. Um, and the failure of that relationship can be devastating for children if an attachment is formed. And with adolescent children, they're dealing with their own sexuality and dating, and having a parent date can be upsetting and confusing. It's important to be open with children of all ages, but particularly with adolescents. Um, and again, reassure them that the partner is not meant to replace anybody or, or even the children, not meant to diminish the relationship between you and, and your children. So clear, open, honest communication is called for. So we are a diverse society with a variety of living styles. We're straight, bisexual, gay, lesbian, transgender, we live alone, we cohabitate, we marry, we divorce, oftentimes we marry again, or we choose to be single for life. Many different lifestyle choices. <clears throat> Recently, there has been a sharp increase in the number of adults that live alone. Some of these adults have never been married or have married and experienced divorce or are widowed, or they have simply chosen to live alone. There are even some married couples that choose to live separately. So some find it highly rewarding to live alone, some don't. Um, in your textbook, page 344, to offer suggestions for combating loneliness for those that do live alone. Uh, just some ideas. As far as cohabitating, this refers to unmarried persons living together in a sexual intimate relationship. Just like living alone, research shows that this has increased over the years. People who, co co <laughs> People who cohabitate are every type of sexual orientation um, and even every type of, of relationship status. So they can be heterosexual, lesbian, gay, bisexual, never married, divorced, widowed, etc. Um, why people do it? Most people report they do it for economic reasons. It makes more sense to just manage one household. Um, but that's not always the only reason, or nor should it be. They also do it to gain intimacy, companionship, um, security, even for convenience. And it used to be that research showed that if a couple cohabitated before they got married, they were more likely to divorce. But recent research now shows that if a couple decides to cohabitate with the intention of getting married compared to couples that cohabitate without ever discussing an, an intention to marry, 
that it's the couples without the intention to marry that are more likely or at higher risk for divorce if they do marry. And that couples that cohabitate with the intention of marriage have, don't have higher divorce rates than those that didn't cohabitate before marriage. Hope that made sense. Um, as far as some long-term trends when it comes to marriage, more people are choosing to never marry. Um, there's less social pressure to marry. People can feel free to remain single if they want to. The average age of marriage has increased. It's now around 25 or 26 for women, 29 to 30 for men. Um, and then the Defense Against Marriage Act, sometimes referred to as DOMA. Um, this was an act, a policy that said states don't have to recognize marriage licenses from other states unless it is a marriage between a man and a woman. It also only defined marriage as between a man and a woman so that any federal policies that dealt with marriages, if they did not, if it was a federal policy, even if the state allowed same-sex couples to get married, they were not eligible for federal benefits. But now DOMA has been struck down. It was ruled unconstitutional last summer. And so many states have moved ahead with legalizing same-sex marriage. And probably this is a trend that's going to continue. Currently, there are um, 16 states plus Washington, D.C. that have legalized same-sex marriage. Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland. Hold on. So I had to pause there for a moment. I don't know where I started. So I'm just going to start the list over. So that's Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, Minnesota, Washington, California, Illinois, Iowa, New York, Maine, and Utah. Although Utah has put a halt on, while it became legal in December, um, there is a halt on performing marriages at the moment. And then Washington, D.C. as well. The debate about gay and lesbian partnerships and whether or not same-sex couples should be given the right to marry. Um, honestly, since I started teaching this class, this debate has changed over time. So I've kind of had to update a little bit of my research um, and where this stands. Because when I first started teaching this class, only Massachusetts had legalized same-sex marriage. Um, actually, when I really first started teaching as a grad student, no states had legalized it, uh, but now Massachusetts did, and then I just read off a list of the states that have passed it. So from a policy standpoint, most professional organizations that deal with families and individuals take the stand that same-sex couples should marry or be given the legal right to marry because of health-related rights and protections um, things like access to employer-related health and retirement benefits. It would actually reduce the number of people using Medicaid or other taxpayer-funded benefits if they were covered under their married partner's employer um, health benefits. Rights to, also rights to make medical decisions for a sick or incapacitated partner. Um, also would increase financial and emotional security for children that are being raised by same-sex couples, access to courts in case of divorce and child custody. And so you may think even if you're against same-sex marriage or even against same-sex couples raising children, they still are. So there are still about one-fifth one of, a little bit more than that actually, it's almost one-fourth of male couples, same-sex male couples are raising children, and over a third of same-sex female couples are raising children. So it's already happening, whether or not people agree to it or not. Um, and children can lose the right to live with a non-biological parent after their biological parent dies if same-sex marriage is not legalized. 
Um, children also would not be able to inherit or have access to the parent that passed away, their social security benefits, and they could suffer a continued loss of financial support and a continued relationship with the non-biological parent if the couple separates or one dies. And so from a policy standpoint, from a children's point of view, it is important actually to family and consumer science professionals to improve the quality of life for individuals, families, and communities. And part of doing that is looking at things from a family perspective. And so from a family perspective, it would make sense to legalize same-sex marriage at the federal level instead of just individually with states. Um, some things to consider. Many people build their case against homosexuality almost entirely on what the Bible says. Uh, most people that are against same-sex marriage will cite religion as the reason why. However, Jesus actually said nothing about same-sex behavior. Um, the Jewish prophets are silent about homosexuality. Only six or seven of the Bible's millions of verses refer to same-sex behavior in any way, and none of them refer to same-sex or homosexual sexual orientation as it's understood today, um, as close, intimate relationships. Um, also, the Bible has been used to support suffering, bloodshed, and death in the past. Um, in our past recent history, the Bible has been used to support slavery, segregation, it's been used to persecute Jews and other non-Christian people of faith. It was used to support Hitler and the Holocaust. It's been used to oppose medical science, to condemn interracial marriage, to execute women as witches, and to support hate groups like the Ku Klux Klan. And if we based all of our behavior today on the Bible, anyone that committed adultery would be stoned to death. If it was found out that a bride wasn't a virgin, she'd be executed by stoning. Divorce would be strictly prohibited, as would remarriage. There'd be no sexual intercourse occurring during a woman's menstrual period. If a man died childless, his widow would be ordered to have intercourse with each of his brothers until she bore her deceased husband a male heir. <clears throat> so inter interestingly enough, some things are taken out of the Bible and used to um, support certain views while other things are ignored. The Bible does say that it's natural for a man and woman to come together to create a new life. And that's another reason why a lot of people say it's immoral or unnatural. But if this was the case, wouldn't we exclude marriage rights to couples that re choose to remain childless or anyone that's sterile? Or what about couples that are too old to have children? Are they unnatural? So, I mean, you have to think about what's fair and what's equal. And again, improving the quality of life for all families, regardless of your individual viewpoints, values, beliefs, and principles. So just some food for thought when it comes to same-sex marriage. Um, looking at infidelity and what the research says, um, monogamy refers to sexual exclusiveness, so being only engaging in sexual behavior, intercourse with one partner. Non-monogamy is when one or both partners have multiple sexual partners. And this is a choice. Um, most couples do strive for monogamy, but there are many couples or even individuals that prefer to have multiple relationships, multiple sexual partners. As far as attitudes about affairs, there are very clear gender differences on how people feel about them. Most of the research, again, has looked at heterosexual couples or individuals, um, and research shows that heterosexual men place more importance on their partner's sexual faithfulness than their own. Um, and then heterosexual and homosexual women place equal importance on faithfulness for both partners. So interestingly enough, um, men tend to think it's okay for them, but not okay for their partner. Women say, no, it's not okay for either one. 
and men react more strongly to sexual infidelity, while women react more strongly to emotional infidelity. And so women are more likely to consider emailing somebody, texting with them, um, you know, even if they've never met, but they have that emotional relationship, a woman is more likely to consider that cheating than a man. It really doesn't matter how you define affairs. What does matter is that you have an upfront, clear, open communication about infidelity and how you each define it so that you're both going into it with eyes wide open and not surprised later. Um, deal, as far as dealing with affairs, affairs are usually the result of the deterioration of relationships rather than the cause. And so rather than automatically assuming that the discovery of, of an affair has to lead to termination of a relationship, really couples need to focus on what was going on prior to the infidelity because it's often the result of the deterioration of relationships, not the cause. Um, it is possible to overcome or deal with affairs, but both partners have to be involved in marriage counseling. And it is unlikely it'll work if both partners are not. Um, research shows that both have to be fully invested. And not only does the non, um, I don't want to say cheating, but I don't know what else to say, the partner that didn't commit infidelity, they have to learn to trust their partner again, but both have to deal with the issues that existed prior to the infidelity. So in order to move past it, counseling of both partners is a must. Okay, as far as divorce, much more common today than ever before. But the statistic that half of all marriages end in divorce is actually incorrect. Um, it's actually two out of five marriages will end in divorce, which sounds much more optimistic than one in two. And the way that that statistic came about, the one in two, was looking at how many people got married on a yearly basis and how many people got divorced on a yearly basis and comparing those figures. However, it didn't look at couples over time and whether they're more likely to divorce. So if you follow couples over time, you find out that only about 42% of married couples end up divorcing and that most actually don't. Much, much more clear when looking at longitudinal research than just comparing marriage and divorce rates for people that aren't have nothing to do with each other. <clears throat> Regardless, divorce rates are high and there's always questions about why this is the case. There are four main reasons according to the research. One is the liberalization of divorce laws or laws that make it easier to get divorced. Um, another is the increased expectation for the ideal mate. Um, so this, the media tends to portray that there is one ideal soulmate for people. Um, and then individuals start expecting their partner to fulfill them sexually, emotionally, spiritually, etc. And if one thing goes wrong, they think this must not be the person I'm supposed to be with. Um, also changes in childbearing patterns. So more couples today are choosing not to have children. And when that's the case, it's much easier to separate and divorce. And then finally, attitudes towards divorce are just more acceptable. It used to be there were much more negative attitudes um, back in the 60s, 70s, even into the 80s. Now, however, it's much more acceptable. So that concludes Chapter 6. It's the last chapter I'm going to cover before the exam. And it'll be important for you guys to be familiar, not only with material I've lectured on, but also the material covered in the textbook. Okay, thank you.